Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the third of four conversations with practitioners about the What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide on Effective Advising for Post-Secondary Students. This Practitioner's Perspectives video series is designed to convene practitioners from the field to discuss their on-the-ground experience in implementing the Practice Guide recommendations. My name is Yifong Chang, and I am a researcher at Act Associates and the Deputy Project Director of the What Works Clearinghouse Post-Secondary Contract, funded by IES. Today, I am joined by Sarah Ackerson, who is one of the expert panelists who supported the development of the Practice Guide. Sarah Ackerson is a career counselor and academic advisor at Manchester Community College in New Hampshire. She has over 12 years of advising experience, working with students of all backgrounds, focusing on transfer and first generation students. She served on the Nakata's Global Community for Academic Advising Webinar Advisory Board, Nakata's Professional Development Committee, and as a Nakata Emerging Leader Mentor. We are also so fortunate to be joined by two expert practitioners today. Dr. Tom Dick Dixon currently serves as the Assistant Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education at the University of California, Riverside, where he oversees an array of co-curricular and curricular student success and engagement programs, as well as the campus's first generation initiatives. As part of this work, he oversees models of peer mentoring for undergraduate research, as well as the Campus Collective Peer Mentoring Program, which utilizes text message peer-to-peer -peer engagement. Prior to this, Dr. Dixon served as the Assistant Dean of Student Affairs for the College of Nursing at the University of Arizona and in multiple academic advising and advising administration roles at the Arizona State University. And Dr. Julie Lee currently directs Brown University's academic support services, manages learning initiatives, and administers Brown's transfer and non-traditional student advising programs with a strong commitment to helping students from marginalized backgrounds. Prior to this, she completed the Administrative Fellowship Program at Harvard University, sponsored by the Office of Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity, while she also held an appointment as staff psychologist at the university. She is a clinical psychologist and an affiliate faculty at the Center for Cross-Cultural Student Emotional Wellness at Massachusetts General Hospital. Welcome everyone today. Before I turn the time over to our experts, I want to briefly introduce Recommendation 3 and its evidence rating. Recommendation 3 in the practice guide is to use mentoring and coaching to enhance comprehensive integrated advising in ways that support students' achievement and progression. The terms mentoring and coaching are sometimes used interchangeably, but the terms differ. Mentoring describes a supportive learning relationship between a student and a mentor. Oftentimes, these mentors are faculty members, student peers, or professionals with experience and knowledge in the student's desired field. Mentors are committed to supporting the student, sharing their own experiences, offering guidance, and serving as an informal role model to the student. Coaching is more formal and structured and is anchored in specific student learning or developmental goals. Coaching is increasingly becoming professionalized with individuals designated as student success coaches, undergoing specialized training and following special specific coaching models when working with students. The What Works Clearinghouse team and the expert panel assigned recommendation three a strong level of evidence, which means that there is consistent evidence that meets What Works Clearinghouse standards and indicates that the practices improve student outcomes for a diverse population of students. This rating was based on 12 studies of interventions that include mentoring or coaching implemented with post-secondary students in the United States or Canada. Eight out of the 12 studies meet What Works Clearinghouse Group Design Standards without reservations, and the other four meet What Works Clearinghouse Group Design Standards with reservations. The evidence from these 12 studies provides a direct test of the recommendation as mentoring or coaching is a primary component of the intervention in eight studies and a secondary component in four studies. The mentoring or coaching was provided through peer mentors, coaches, or faculty members. For each recommendation, the practice guide provides details about the recommended practice, 
including how the panel arrived at the level of evidence rating, guidance about how to carry out the recommendation, potential obstacles and solutions, and tools and resources to support carrying out the recommendation. The practice guide offers five steps on how to carry out recommendation three. First, determine whether and if so how mentors or coaches could be used to enhance the, su the supports students currently receive. When gaps are identified in student supports, institutions can determine whether these gaps can be addressed by mentors or coaches and craft a specific role for these individuals. So, for example, peer mentors can help students with technology and unmask the hidden rules of college. Faculty members can help students access research and internship opportunities and provide guidance on further education. Coaches can be used to facilitate conversations that allow for self-reflection. Second, decide who will deliver mentoring and or coaching. Peers, faculty, or outside professionals may be well suited to serve as mentors or coaches. However, all will have their strengths or weaknesses, such as competing responsibilities and demands on their time, and levels of training and preparation for taking on the role. Third, focus mentoring on topics that prepare students for advising. The work of mentors and advisors can be complementary, and the activities they undertake with students can be structured to maximize the benefits of both. So, for example, mentors can discuss topics with students that prepare them to get the most out of their meetings with their advisor. Step four is to carefully consider the format, frequency, and duration of mentoring and or coaching. Mentoring and coaching can be delivered in person or virtually. The duration can be as short as one semester or less or last an entire academic year. The frequency of meetings, such as weekly, biweekly, or monthly, and the format, such as one-on-one -on -one or small group, can also vary. And finally, provide mentors or coaches with initial and ongoing training. The training should be tailored to the role and purpose of the mentoring and coaching. So that was a quick summary of recommendation three in the practice guide. And now I'm happy to turn the presentation over to Sarah and our expert practitioners who will provide more insight and share examples of how this recommendation is being implemented on their respective college campuses. So Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Yvonne. So happy to be joined um, by a few of my colleagues who are doing amazing things on their campuses. Together as practitioners, we're going to share our experiences with mentoring and coaching. I'm going to give Tom and Julie an opportunity to describe the programs that they oversee at the college and how their programs are situated within the larger advising structure of their institution. So, Tom, let's start with you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, I come from the University of California, Riverside. Uh, it's a large public research university with about 20,000 undergraduate students. Um, we are a heavily first gen population, uh, over 58%, uh, as well as the same percentage of Pell eligible students, um, and we're a Hispanic serving institution. Um, I oversee our student engagement unit in the Office of Undergraduate Education, and this includes our Academic Resource Center, which is our campus tutoring and academic support services. Uh, I also, also oversee our experiential learning unit, um, which includes service learning, community engagement, uh, our undergraduate research center, our prestigious scholarships and awards. Um, I also work with our unique program known as R Courses which is uh, similar to the Berkeley decal program where students can actually invent and teach their own classes to other students. So they get to develop and innovate their own curriculum. Um, and finally, I also oversee our Health Professions Advising Center, uh, which employs a variety of peer mentoring supports as well as professional advising for our students. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Aifeng. I'm honored to be on this panel this uh, morning. Um, uh, Brown University has about 64 um, undergraduate. Uh, we are a residential liberal arts institution with an open curriculum. Most students live on campus for at least three years. Upon matriculation, every first year student is assigned to an academic advisor who may be faculty, staff, 
or an academic dean. Once the student declares a major, they're assigned to a departmental faculty advisor. There are three um, peer mentoring um, models uh, that are related um, and also work together to provide academic advising and support. First is the peer mentoring model for all first years who matriculate at Brown. All of our students, first year students are matched with the first year peer advisor who work closely with a assigned faculty member. Uh, second program um, on our campus provide peer support for students um, who, are, who have questions related to navigating the curriculum, um, making choices about their concentration or major, or um, potentially creating an independent um, concentration, or even taking a leave of absence. Peer mentors provide support for students um, on those um, topics on a drop-in basis. The third program, the program that I oversee, is uh, academic support services, which encompasses peer academic coaching. Our program is grounded in the near peer mentoring model. Currently, students come to us through referrals from their faculty, advisor, deans, or members of the Committee on Academic Standing, or other staff um, members on campus. Um, each student who is referred for academic coaching is paired with a coach who is either a junior, senior, or graduate student at Brown. Um, Brown, as I mentioned, has an open curriculum, so there are far fewer curriculum requirements um, um, for our students than there might be for others. This allows uh, students to explore their academic interest, but they also benefit from additional support with course selection or concentration consideration. Having a peer to think through curricular options is important, and the peer coaches um, also support students on other um, academic and uh, non-academic related issues. Great, I'm really happy that we have such a diverse uh, background here on our panel right now. So we know that academic advisors are tasked with a multitude of responsibilities. Um, and in my experience, we've had mentors and coaches that have helped us meet the growing needs of our students. In my experience, our faculty have served as career mentors um, and our peer mentors were able to share insights into different courses and success strategies um, based on that. Perhaps even more helpful, they were able to show other students how to utilize our technology in ways that made sense to them. So in what ways are mentoring and or coaching used to enhance advising on your campus? And what specifically do mentors or coaches offer that might help fill some of the gaps that advisors aren't able to do? Yeah. Sarah, that's a great question. Uh, the benefit of peer coaching are many, uh, but first thing that comes to my mind is that students feel comfortable expressing uh, their doubts, concerns, or questions to their peers. Uh, faculty uh, members are often accessible and inviting, but uh, students often feel the power dynamic and hierarchy that is inherent in the faculty and student relationship. Thus, having a peer to really think through the curricular options and academic and collegiate transition issues um, has been um, proven to be very uh, beneficial and helpful for Brown students. In addition, uh, this near um, a peer model provides students a space and opportunity to authentically explore the questions they might have on their mind but isn't quite ready to share with their faculty. Peers can um, um, also uh, kind of process and think about targeted and reflective questions um, so that they could actually bring those questions to their faculty advisors with a little bit more comfort and confidence. Doing so could help uh, make the conversation with faculty members more specific um, and beneficial. For example, a student who wants to find an internship or research opportunity might not know how to bring that up uh, with their faculty member um, who you know, they are just getting to know. Our coaches will, uh, will share specific suggestions, um, such as reading um, about uh, reading a, a, about a research uh, work that faculty uh, member has done, or maybe even look up the information about the lab uh, they're learning. By doing so, where uh, the peer leaders can really prepare and help um, the students um, to make the most of the academic um, advising that is offered by the faculty. 
Um, the second important aspect um, is that there, um, as we all know, there has been a considerable discussion about hidden curriculum and the role of social capital in the student's adjustment to college. Being able to establish a relationship and, and bring questions like we we're talking about to the faculty is a developmental step that is important in the collegiate experience, but not something that uh, we could assume comes naturally for all students. Our peer coaches help students to create a meaningful connection with their faculty, and I believe that's a very important role they play. And I'll, I'll hop in and talk a little bit about hidden curriculum. Uh, a lot of our programs are designed around helping students understand and navigate uh, some of the hidden curriculum of campus that Julie was just referring to. Uh, we use a lot of peer support programs to help students with that, with kind of that social and cultural capital acquisition. Uh, a lot of that is involving our peer-to-peer um, -peer, uh, text messaging program where students are exchanging kind of that social and cultural capital. Uh, we like to say they're mimicking the hallway conversations. Um, they're exchanging information between continuing junior, senior students and our first year students. Um, but for our advising programs, uh, specifically our health professions advising program uses a peer ambassador, peer advisor model to really help students explore the introductory components of health careers. Uh, there's a whole range of potential health careers out there for students. Most think they're just going into medicine, but there are tons of different programs out there that a lot of students haven't explored yet. And so we tend to leverage our peer ambassadors to help with that exploration, that early exploration of introductory requirements, of prerequisites, of the nature of the different types of health careers and tracks that are the fundamentals of getting started in the health professions. Um, so usually the way it works with us is students start off with meeting with our peers. So say they, they initially they, they attend a workshop that introduces them to health professions. And then they advance to working one on one with our peer advisors. Um, and they can do those through walk-ins or structured um, meetings. And the peer advisors really help prepare those students for the more intensive advising sessions with our professional advisors, of which we only have two, um, to help support all of our students exploring all of the different health professions. So they end up providing a nice kind of triage layer in the exploratory phase, and as the students get more refined in their interests, they're able to move forward with the specialty advising from our advisors. Now, our peer ambassadors uh, all have different areas and professional interests, so we try to book those op open office hours and structure those meetings when students are working with other students around those interests. So we're trying to pair pharmacy students with those that are interested in pharmacy because we find that there is a richness of experience and knowledge of the students who are actually going through and exploring that career. They're also matching up with the student who's trying to start off exploring and matching in that career. Um, again, a lot of students come in only thinking of medicine, medicine, medicine. They, they think, I just wanna be a doctor, but they don't know that there is a whole range of all the different things that might be good fits for them, but all they think of is the standard, I need to be a doctor. And so this really helps them explore all the different avenues and also explore all of the right skills, requirements, and experiences that are necessary to be successful. Um, our peer ambassadors tend to often run into the same challenge our advisors do, which is, they're challenged by their peers in in the you know have you thought about this or have you thought about these pieces um have you thought about you know being a, a uh you know physician's assistant instead of being an md or a do um have you thought about being a nurse practitioner uh you know exploring all of these different areas that might be very much parallel or akin to what they're studying um and oftentimes in advising and as with our peers as well you can be kind of seen as a dream crusher or a dream killer uh, by students if you're 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 nudge if you seem to be nudging students too far one direction, um, and so the peers can tend to do that from a more inquisitive point of view, um, a less challenging um, viewpoint. So it feels like it's less formal in helping them explore, and so it lets them have a little a little bit more comfort, and it lays a lot of extra groundwork in helping students kind of get focused on what it is they truly want to lock in on. Um, and then the co the coaching can happen later on 
with the advisor who is able to then do the more intensive work, helping them figure out how to do interviews, set up shadowing, networking, developing some of the skills necessary that are gonna help them with their applications to graduate school. Um, and again, we do these through online workshops, in-person workshops. Um, we try to address when and how students want supports with a variety of different modalities. Great, thanks both of you for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, as you were talking, I, I think you both touched upon the how-to of step number three, which suggests that mentors or coaches can help students prepare for the one-on-one -on -one appointments with their advisors. Um, I think that based on what you both were saying, I think it can help students go into the appointment and have it be less transactional and more of an actual meaningful conversation, which is just what we want. So a few logistical questions. One of the biggest challenges um, is finding people who can fill these roles, um, especially when they're also doing faculty work or you know, are serving as full-time students who might be working full-time, all different scenarios. Um, in my experience, we were able to provide stipends for our peer mentors and our faculty mentors, um, which, as you can imagine, was a big incentive. Um, and we also did some professional development opportunities. So first, how do you decide who will, do, who will deliver this mentoring or coaching on your campuses? And can you also talk about any compensation, uh, money, or otherwise <laughs> that you provide for your peer mentors or coaches? Uh, those are very practical and important questions, Sarah. Um, I'll be happy to share what we do on campus at Brown. Um, all the peer mentoring programs that I mentioned previously are uh, offered through our uh, students, uh, both undergraduate and, and graduate student. And we recruit in a few different ways. Uh, first, we uh, post our positions for academic coach, um, coaching position um, through a university-wide um, email um, and communication um, uh, you know, a process. Uh, the application process end up being very competitive uh, because we get many more applicants than the number of open positions we have each year. Um, so that does put us in a very fortunate position to be able to uh, really think about the composition of the team and the, the coaches that we want to uh, bring to our team to uh, support uh, the students. Our uh, coaches are compensated on an hourly basis, so I'm grateful for the financial commitment from the college. Um, I think this is very important because this financial resource make it possible for students um, who are needing a campus job to apply for a peer coaching position. Uh, funding makes it possible for us to recruit and hire a diverse group of students along the SES line, which I believe is very important for uh, serving the uh, a diverse student um, um, population. In addition to posting the pos uh, position online, I reach out to specific departments and student groups to make sure that we have representation from um, students from various backgrounds and interest groups. For example, uh, computer science is a growing concentration, um, so I recruit from the department by sending an email to a department um, and asking them to share the job posting with their students. Um, um, another example is I uh, want to ensure that we have academic coaches who identify as a low income, um, undocumented or uh, first generation students. Thus, I reach out to um, our student group on campus who serve those students, affinity group that serve that student population um, and make sure that um, the students are informed about opportunity to be an academic coach. Um, another example of a student group that I reach out to is a black um, engineering student group. Um, um, and that has also been a wonderful uh, way to recruit engineering students to be in our team. Deciding on um, who to select as a peer coach um, can be challenging at times. Uh, in fact, when you have so many good choices. Um, in the selection process, I try to look at uh, both the team um, uh, for its composition, as well as the individual coaches' experience and commitment to near peering mentoring experience. I use the historical data of students who have received coaching to get a better, uh, to get a good sense of what background and what composition team would serve students the best. For example, having coaches with a STEM um, concentration background is important for our team because we have a lot of students who end up working with the coaches um, who uh, that uh, that uh, take STEM courses. Um, in terms of other forms of diversity, I consider gender, gender identity, as well as um, as I mentioned, uh, whether student identify as first generation or not, as well as their academic and personal background. Um, I also try to recruit some athletes um, to be on our team because students. Um, 
um, you know, want um, often want to have another um, a student who understands the challenge of balancing academic work uh, with athletic responsibilities. Um, in addition to STEM students, having students who are in humanities and social sciences um, obviously uh, really broaden um, our perspective. Um, I also try to balance the class year so that I'm not recruiting an entirely new team every year. Um, and that's, uh, that could be challenging, as you can imagine, for a few different regions. Um, we've been very fortunate because we've been able to retain 100% of the junior um, year coaches to continue to serve on our team. So that has given us a, a continuity on our team. And I would want to point out, so Julie has some points about compensation, um, and I wanted to highlight from some of our health peer mentors, you know, we would really love to have them compensated, but we don't have the budgets for that. Uh, our campus is just not in a place to be able to compensate. Um, in terms of health professions, um, peer, peer advising, um, they really end up needing a lot of volunteer hours for a lot of different um, professional programs in health. And a lot of students use those hours as being a peer advisor towards those applications. So there is something that is tangibly coming out of it. They're getting volunteer hours that a lot of the schools are counting towards um, their professional development, just as if they were, say, shadowing at a healthcare facility. Um, and so a lot of our students are doing it for that component as much as they are doing it for kind of that intrinsic value. Um, piece as well. Uh, on our campus, uh, we have over 60% of our students are Pell eligible. We have a very high low income um, uh, population. Uh, we're very sensitive about the idea of unpaid student labor. So we're constantly trying to find ways to help compensate students for those roles. Uh, we're also looking at other things beyond, you know, the external uh, validation of uh, volunteer hours. We're trying to see if we can't find opportunities to do things like award course credit or even get stipends. Um, so I actually do a lot of work with donors trying to recruit donor funding um, to try to create a stipend system for our peer coaching model. So our students will be able to get something for that time. Um, now, in a prior role, when I was working in a uh, college of education, we actually used a, a combination of both peer mentors and peer coaches. Um, a lot of these uh, peer coaches were also like first year success course instructors, and they were often given essentially course credit for teaching those courses, but they were also um, getting compensated for doing that instruction component. So they were being paid stipends for that instruction component. Um, and again, these were juniors and seniors who were starting their student teaching process. And in the College of Education, they're getting immense value from that teaching practice to be able to teach to their, their um, you know, freshman colleagues and freshman peers. So, but again, most campuses don't have budgets like that. Um, our camp, my campus right now doesn't have budgets that can support that sort of thing. Um, so we always try to find the maximum amount of secondary compensation, um, a, a ways of recognition to be able to help support those peer models. Great, thank you. Um, so another logistics question about peer mentoring that's offered on your campuses. Um, so when we were developing the practice guide, we did speak a lot about making sure that the students who were serving as peer mentors were, avail were aware of available resources on campus um, and that they knew who to seek out for those certain supports. We discussed the importance of knowing when to refer, the boundaries um, between the role of a peer mentor or a peer coach and an academic advisor, um, particularly when it pertains to policies and curriculum. Um, that can always be a high tension point. So how do you communicate with your students um, on your campuses about the different roles between academic advisors, uh, professional advisors, uh, mentors, and coaches. Um, at Brown, we take multifaceted approach to letting students know about our mentoring and academic support services. Um, first, um, a few times a year, um, and certainly in the beginning of each semester, uh, we write to um, academic, um, all the students um, and let them know about services that we uh, our office uh, offers. Um, um, I think. Um, 
you know, even the returning students, I find that appreciate the, the reminder um, in the beginning of each semester. Uh, we actually even find that um, for first year students and self, uh, sophomore students, um, you know, beginning of the second semester is a great time to uh, really uh, invigorate uh, their sort of engagement. Um, so we have gotten uh, uh, appreciative feedback about that communication. Secondly, we shared the information about service directly with the faculty, department chairs, um, academic deans, and staff members who worked directly with the students, um, either academically or on a personal um, um, issues. Um, we find that some students um, may go directly to the faculty um, instead of advising staff, or may go to residential staff members, um, or uh, the staff members who are supporting student affinity groups. So I, um, we have found that to be really um, helpful um, to engage all those members of the community. And lastly, as I mentioned previously, we reach out to the student groups directly. Um, and um, I appreciate what Tom said earlier about using text message. Um, we have actually implemented a social media campaign in the last couple of years, um, and students have found that to be really informative. So I want to touch on a, a key distinction with a lot of this. And, and so there's often a very fine distinction between coaching, mentoring, advising, and even the guidance or therapeutic type of counseling. And those all lines often get very blurred. Um, for us, we're very clear with our peer mentors. Their job is to provide knowledge, to help provide cultural knowledge, cultural capital, operations, logistics, uh, general campus resource information. Their job is to help their mentee find resources, give some life examples, talk about their life experiences, but we draw a very firm line on giving advice on specific courses to take or exact degree requirements to take or on talking through personal elements that one might discuss with a therapist. And so we know that it's going to happen. We also know that it's, it's, it's natural for that kind of a relationship to develop, to be able to share. And we want to encourage our students to be able to have those kind of bonds with their peers. And it's okay to vent and discuss the activities of our lives. Um, but we want to be able to make sure that, um, that when we do go beyond that kind of supportive listening, we limit ourselves that we're not starting to give solutions to personal issues because that ultimately starts crossing a line that our students are just not trained, licensed, or prepared for. And honestly, we shouldn't be putting that burden on them to do something at that level. Um, for advising, counseling, therapy, again, we direct them to a camp campus resources right away, and we keep encouraging them to use those resources, um, and we make sure that they've done so. Great. I'm sure that as we're recovering or continuing to make our way through the pandemic, you know, having a peer to talk to about the adjustment back to campus, um, if students are returning to campus or staying online is, is going to be really important. So another resources related question, these are my favorite. Um, what types of training, both initial and ongoing, do you provide your mentors and coaches to support their success? Um, before the start of each uh, uh, fall semester, uh, we have a training program uh, for both uh, new as well as the returning coaches. Uh, returning coaches play a, a vital role in presenting and really engaging the new coaches, and I appreciate their participation. Um, returning coaches um, also have an opportunity to give example of uh, uh, obviously protecting and, and appreciating the privacy of the students they've served, but they are able to sort of even talk about uh, those sort of scenarios um, and uh, uh, um, uh, examples of the topics um, and uh, conversations that um, uh, returning coaches have had. Um, we do have a training curriculum for the new new coaches that uh, that have evolved over the course of our time, um, work, um, and the curriculum covers the principles of academic coaching, and that includes a sort of more tactical component of coaching in terms of uh, you know how to um, conduct the first meeting, um, you know what are some of the icebreakers, um, how do you establish a empathic and uh, uh, open communication, um, some of the uh, top Topics that have uh, been very important and uh, been engaging for the coaches and our team has been active listening as well as motivational interview skills um, so that uh, that uh, the relationship between a student and the uh, coach uh, can really be um, one in which uh, there would be a meaningful dialogue. 
Um, we um, also talk about boundary issues um, because those are very uh, important issues as Tan has just spoke. Um, we do talk very specific about, you know, where, where to meet, if when when we were uh, students were meeting um, uh, in person, obviously since uh, COVID, uh, we transitioned to virtual meetings and um, fall of 2020, we're, we're continuing to offer coaching meetings uh, virtually. Uh, so in addition to, um, you know, where to meet, I think we do talk about uh, what are appropriate topics and boundaries of uh, discussion points um, between the, the coach and the students, and what are the topics that should be referred directly to uh, professionals, whether they're academic um, teens or advisors or uh, therapist. Um, we also um, emphasize uh, that um, there should be no romantic relationship uh, whatsoever between the peer and the student. And that may seem intuitive and obvious, but I think that's an important uh, uh, point to emphasize. And we actually even talk about how do you um, acknowledge um, uh, 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 if a coach were to run into their student on campus at a social event, you know, how do you manage that uh, so that um, it doesn't put a student on the spot? Um, so some of these topics are very tactical and the other ones are a little bit more conceptual. Uh, we do talk about, you know, sort of developmental issues, um, academic milestone that students experience in each year of their, um, you know, uh, traditional sort of four year um, uh, collegiate experience, even though many students are now taking time off and taking alternative pathways. Um, we, um, in terms of actually, um, a coach meeting with the students, um, we have a very uh, clear and, and, and um, uh, specific agenda for the first three or four meetings. We do think that there are topics that should be dis uh, discussed with each student. That includes um, what their academic strengths are, what their learning styles are, what their goals are, and what are some of the specific challenges they have experienced? So we uh, really talk a lot about ways in which um, we do have some questionnaires and feedback that we ask from the students and um, really uh, try to spend first uh, meeting or two so that students could um, uh, identify one or two actionable and specific academic goal for each semester. Uh, during the first two years at Brown, many students will e explore uh, uh, the curriculum uh, very broadly because, again, as I mentioned, we have open curriculum. So um, we acknowledge that that is uh, both exciting and, and challenging opportunity. So uh, we do talk about, um, you know, supporting students in those curricular um, choices as a part of our training program. Um, lastly, um, I want to mention that we meet weekly as a team, um, and that's a very important time for consultation um, as well as for us to come together as a team. Um, um, uh, pure art coaches tend to work about eight to ten hours a week um, and for uh, one hour a week um, uh, team meeting they're actually compensated because we want to acknowledge that it that is an important part of their job. So in addition to our weekly team meeting I actually set aside time for um, um, time uh, during the course of each semester to meet with a coach individually uh, in the beginning of the semester and middle to end of the semester. Um, I try to really uh, get to know each coach and also help them to provide opportunity for their growth and learning. Um, and we find that many of the coaches have uh, grown um, as a leader, as a, a educator, as a peer educator, as well as um, in their own academic experience through their coaching experience. Um, it's been uh, very rewarding to see some of our coaches actually choose to go into the field of higher education or education, um, you know, following their coaching experience. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, both you and um, Tom have seen that too. Thank you. Yeah, our uh, our health professions uh, peer invest ambassadors actually have a pretty intensive um, initial training session. So we tend to do about a 40 to 50 hour uh, training program. Um, it's it's broken up over a couple of weeks before the start of the of the fall term, um, and the training is really extensively reviewing um, both campus policies, but also campus politics. Um, kind of making sure that they're not providing advice that our you know STEM colleges are there to provide, um, because we're providing health professions advising. Uh, there's there's a distinct role and a distinct lane for the work that we're doing there. Um, but we also make sure they also understand the boundaries of where peer advice is, um, the requirements for different 
health degree programs and health career programs, um, there's often a wide variety of different prerequisite requirements in order to get into these different programs. Uh, and we do a thorough review of what those are and the why those are. Um, so they understand the, the reason why these students will need to take the prerequisites to get into those programs. Um, we also cover the big what not to say items, like giving advice on to which schools to apply to, which schools are better than others. Um, that that's not an area that our students are are going our peer ambassadors are going to get into and we we discourage that um we also outline the roles of of ambassadors and then where that transition pivot point is to a professional advisor whether that be with our health professions advising or with the students major college um, advising so again they, we also have them here from alumni who have gone gotten into these programs and who have completed health care programs um they hear from professionals uh in those programs they hear from admissions folks from different health degree programs to learn a little bit about the application processes um, for those different popular health degree options um and our peer ambassadors uh they are probably doing between four to six hours a week, maybe eight hours a week at most um, for open office hours for peer to peer advising. They're structured so that we have essentially <laughs> open office hours the entire day. Um, they also meet once a month for about an hour, maybe hour and a half for for meetings. And often at those meetings, they're given continuing development where we're talk, having um, guest speakers come in from different uh, professional programs and uh, admissions areas from different healthcare programs to talk more about those requirements. Great, I um, really appreciated uh, peer mentors kind of understanding the why and being able to share why you have to take certain courses. Um, I think that can apply across all of our uh, institutions, <laughs> explaining to students why you have to take a particular course. Um, so what are some of the things that you take in consideration and when you're making decisions about the format, the frequency, and the duration of mentoring or coaching per student? Um, I think there are a number of factors that have uh, contributed um, in helping us to uh, think about our program and what would be uh, both most effective as well as uh, you know resource um, effective. Uh, our peer coaches uh, work uh, with anywhere between eight to 12 students at a time. Um, because of uh, you know uh, the number of hours that they're uh, expected to work. Generally, students work with their peer coach for one semester. Um, under extraordinary circumstances, it is possible that students could continue um, coaching um, into the second semester. Usually that is done through the recommendation of a faculty or a dean. Um, um, as I mentioned, uh, we do um, believe that in order for um, each student to experience the benefit of uh, coaching, generally having three to four meetings um, is helpful. Obviously, it's not obligatory, but we do encourage the students to at least uh, connect with their um, assigned coach three to four times because during those, uh, through those meetings, the students could really have an opportunity to explore and reflect upon their challenges as well as their, um, as well as uh, uh, resources that would be helpful for them. Um, some, in terms of actually frequency of the meeting, some most students do meet with their coach weekly, um, but uh, some students after meeting three, four times um, decide that meeting biweekly uh, works better for them um, in terms of their other responsibilities. So we do give, um, we do empower student and coach to make the decision um, accordingly. So. so Talking about decisions about format and duration, I want to tell you a little bit about an initiative that we launched um, in in 2020, um, kind of in the height of a pandemic um, in California. We were entirely remote for the 2020-2021 academic year, and we launched a program called Campus Collective. And this is a text message based peer to peer mentoring program. Um, there, all of the peer mentoring is done via text message. Um, again, we were trying to get students off of you know webex and zoom screens um, there was a lot of that zoom fatigue uh, we were trying to get the into a place where it was accessible where students would be able to look and interact with another peer um, and but the key piece about all of this is that our students are doing not what most mentoring programs do um, a lot of programs are often very elaborate with trainings they have you know a whole semester or a whole quarter of training you know 40 hour training programs like our history our um uh, health professions peer mentoring program. Our program was not meant to do that. 
and get what our goal was was we were me meaning to replicate the missing hallway conversations because of the pandemic you're in zoom rooms or you're in you know webex rooms you're in these video chats and then you leave there was no chance to meet with a peer afterward to have a conversation to ask you know oh, i'm struggling in this class where do i go for that support or how do i get involved with this type of club you can't have that conversation when you're hitting end meeting and so yes. students were missing out on those conversations and so our goal was to help mimic those hallway conversations to focus on that cultural capital exchange that social capital exchange that was not occurring because we didn't have those hallways um, and again the point of the work was to not be an advisor was not to be a essentially a paraprofessional um, the job was to put the student mentors in a situation where they would be exchanging basic information the same things that you would get in a hallway conversation to point students to the right resources um, we did not set a wide range of explicit expectations about how often they needed to communicate um, it was meant it's meant to be an organic process it's meant to to help students interact in an authentic way as frequently as they would like to interact based on what they need um, however that said the system is set up to automatically ping students and remind them hey you haven't yeah. mentioned anything about conversations with your mentee lately how's your mentee doing you might want to check in on them and so it does have automated things if they haven't sent a message to their students um, in a certain amount of time now uh, the students that are mentors can also use that same text messaging system to flag if their mentee is having struggles if they're having trouble um, they can send text messages back to that automated number that, that that we use for this and they can send a coded note that says all right this is this is where a student is struggling in what category and then they can type a message specifically about what that support is needed um, we have staff on the back end who then review those flags and help direct them to the right resources um, but often what we're doing is we're providing the resource back to the mentor so the mentor can give the resource to the student so that way we are not always the point of contact that they're relying on their mentor for that information exchange and now again we designed this program to be an extra added connection to a peer um, that wasn't taking away from anything of the other peer mentoring programs that may have slightly different goals um, we had 37 other programs on campus so trying to find something that didn't take away from what they were doing um, didn't conflict with what they were doing was was a bit of a challenge um, because we wanted people to still be able to connect to those other programs um, for their own reasons in their own authentic ways uh, but we wanted to help students replicate what they couldn't do which was walk down a hallway and have a conversation with a peer um, our program was very successful the last year uh, we ended up with over 800 mentors again all volunteer um, and over 1,800 freshmen, that was 36% of our freshman class. Um, we also had a third of our transfer students um, that were in a transfer cohort as well. Uh, we've relaunched this program for this year, and we've already exceeded that number. We're close to 40% of our freshman class, um, and we're already at a third of our transfer students. So um, again, we're, we're matching fresh, uh, freshmen with juniors and seniors who are continuing on, and we're trying to match transfer students with other transfer students or transfer students with, with um, maybe older uh, seniors uh, in order to be able to help them have the right connections and have the right authentic matches. Um, we're going to keep that program going. Um, and we have, because our campus uh, is, that just doesn't have a huge robust budget um, this this was funded last year and this current year um, on CARES Act funding the the higher education emergency relief funds um, and we're hoping to find some additional sources including some donors to be able to help the program moving forward and I think you know it's all about the connection right and I think that's what the students and probably even the staff and faculty are missing um, which kind of brings us into our next Point. So you all work at institutions that serve diverse student bodies um, and, you know, higher ed research has been showing that students often want to see and learn from others who are similar to them, similar identities and experiences. Um, they want to learn from others who have faced similar scenarios um, and how they've overcome those. So what, if any, efforts do you make? Um, I know we talked about this a little earlier, uh, but what, if any, efforts do you do to recruit and to manage mentors and coaches that reflect the diversity of your student body? Well, I can hop in and say 
So in terms of our, our text message based peer mentoring, um, all of this is, is, isn't in house. We, we've contracted with a company called mentor collective that provides this text messaging based mentorship program. And what we do is we provide them with student emails and phone numbers and they do that, that outreach. We also message out to students ourselves, asking them to sign up students, um, essentially call out a profile, uh, to get matched and, uh, um they we first recruit and train some mentors um the company themselves have a standard um you know half hour 45 minute training again it's the basics of of what not to do um it's the what to do in an emergency it's how to be a good mentor how to stay engaged um and the company's uh, automated systems are the things that help nudge and ping uh the students to make sure that they're regularly interacting with the mentee. Uh, but both of those mentor and mentees take surveys asking about themselves, their hobbies, their interests, their life challenges. Um, and the for mentees, they are asking them the explicit question, what is the most important factor to you in having a mentor? Do you need a mentor who's from the same cultural background? Do you need a same mentor from the same city? Do you need a mentor from the same, well, Alex, the same hobbies? And what they're doing is they're using that first and foremost to be able to help create filters. So that is the first criteria that's applied in creating that selection. There's an algorithm that helps with, with then reducing that list of potential mentors down even further. And then there's a human on the back end who's making the final selection and the final matching. Um, we try not to match more than about five students um, per mentor because we found one or two students with a mentor they don't really stay engaged it's easy to forget about them but anything more than about five or six they become too much to manage and it's hard to, to differentiate between your different mentees um but again the matching is based around something that's authentic it's meant matched around ways they would naturally connect with somebody and it could be anything like you grew up in a single parent household or um, you have a parent who is an alcoholic or you like to play sports or you like a certain type of music. It could be based on race, ethnicity, gender, identity. It could be based on any number of different components. But again, we put it in the hands of the mentee to first identify how they're going to get matched and how they're going to get picked. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate hearing what um, you know Tom's uh, program has done. Um, uh, our program is uh, uh, more hands-on, <laughs> I guess human uh, human based, so to speak. Uh, we have uh, 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 we uh, you know as I sort of referred to earlier, um, we um, first uh, commitment was to really create a team that was uh, diverse um, uh, along many of those uh, factors that was already mentioned, so that we could really serve. Um, and give opportunity for students to uh, let us uh, to uh, to match the students' interests and background. So when students are referred uh, for academic coaching, um, we do actually have um, uh, give opportunity for students to let us know uh, what is the most important factor for them um, in their peer coaching. Interestingly enough, for our campus, um, students um, have identified um, sharing an academic um, interest. And, and being in an academic, um, in the same academic discipline to be one of the most important um, factors. Um, and some of the research also uh, tends to back that up. Um, so what we have done is uh, as the matching, uh, the coaching referrals come in, we initially make uh, the general um, uh, categorization or matching based upon uh, the refer students um, intended or declared academic uh, discipline uh, with the coaches academic discipline. After that, it, um, if the student has made a specific request, um, some students will say, I'm a, I identify, identify as a first generation student. I'd like to work with a, a coach who identify as one. We try to honor that and make that match whenever we can. Um, um, and uh, in addition to uh, sort of looking at those um, um, uh, uh, factors that students have identified, um, I would like to mention uh, that because of work that we do, um, our um, team has uh, really been very explicit and firm in our commitment um, to providing a support that's anti-racist and inclusive. Um, 
So in the summer of 2020, our team came together and um, actually I worked and uh, I wrote a white paper that addresses our commitment and our approach to working with the diverse student body, um, with, uh, irrespective of their background um, and the support that is student-centered, uh, strength-based and empowering. Um, so um, wanted to share that as well. Thank you. I think, you know, you both touched on this, but we're really making it what's most important for the mentee, right? What identifying factor is most important to them rather than what we might think is most important to them, which I think is really important. Um, so we have time for one more question. And I know you both approach your work with a great deal of concern for the well-being of your teams and the students that they serve. And that it's also critical that those boundaries are maintained and that the appropriate referrals are given. So can you each share some of the strategies that you use to promote mental health and wellness uh, within your program for both the mentors and the coaches as well as the students? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's a great question. And I think probably more important now than ever. Um, uh, supporting students holistically in their wellness and mental health um, has always been an important aspect of our program um, since its inception. The emphasis of mental health has increased um, in the last uh, year and a half due to COVID and all the transitions um, and uh, challenges that our students have navigated. Uh, when coaches first make a contact with the students, um, uh, you know, and as they're building their relationship, um, all the coaches uh, really emphasize and, and center our work um, on the premise that uh, students' wellness and mental health, as well as physical wellness, is really the, the highest priority. Um, Many of our students are very high achieving um, and they tend to have uh, take a substantial extracurricular um, activities or many students are working um, and have multiple jobs, either by choice or out of uh, financial needs. And we also, of course, know that there are students who have uh, responsibilities and obligation to their families or community members as well. So recognizing that students' uh, mental health and wellness um, obviously um, is important, and um, it's, it's important to really acknowledge the impact of all those different aspects of our life in addition to um, you know, uh, focusing on their academic experience. So to that end, um, the, our coaches um, are proactively um, try to engage students and ask them questions to sort of self-monitor um, how they're doing. Um, and uh, we talk about this extensively in our training program as well as in our, in our weekly meetings to say what are the appropriate ways in which we could engage students to um, continue to self-monitor and to uh, develop self-awareness and to actually identify point at which they might benefit or need professional help. So some of the questions that we generally ask are, in addition to just how was your week or how things are going, um, is to ask how are you doing with your mental health? Um, or do you feel your level of stress is at a point where you think you might need help? or you will benefit from getting help. Um, we don't necessarily have a one script uh, for all the coaches to use per se, but I think increasingly uh, we're uh, wanting to really in, uh, incorporate those language um, and invitation into our coaching program. Um, obviously, uh, firmly uh, holding to the boundaries and, and and point at which the students will need to be referred um, um, to the professional help. Um, in addition to the work that we do um, in individual academic coaching, academic support services also offer workshops that are related to mental health and self-care, often in collaboration with uh, staff members and student support or counseling centers. Uh, we may sometimes plan an event or host a table event in a central location. This was pre-COVID, obviously, um, where uh, we might have pamphlets or have even giveaway to talk about sort of all, all these issues that are related to mental health. Um, well, one of the popular topics on our campus has been importance of sleep. Uh, we know that having getting seven to eight hours sleep is a challenge uh, for our students. Um, having a regular schedule is a challenge. We all understand that. Um, so we try to provide a practical and realistic solutions that could be helpful. We talk about um, finding a way to de-stress and find some moment of mindfulness, um, um, uh, depending on their lifestyle. For some students, you know, taking a walk on campus could be a beneficial way. For other students, using um, you know. Uh, uh, 
uh, one of the the mindfulness uh, app um, that could really help them to uh, engage um, um, deeply uh, within themselves can be helpful. Or even taking um, scheduling a, a completely social break uh, from their work and other responsibilities. Again, many of those had to be adapted and. Um, and offer virtually uh, during the COVID time. Um, but I appreciate this question, um, uh, Sarah, and uh, I think it's really important for all of us to continue to um, address uh, really the important balance between the academic experience of our students as well as their wellness. I'll have to follow up with you on how to improve my sleep habits later. Um, in terms of our, some of our programming, our text message program is really meant to be about those hallway conversations, as I've said before. Um, and so it's all about that social and cultural capital exchange that was hard to find during that pandemic. Um, and so we're really hoping that um, most of our wellness elements are built into the referrals that students are making to our different campus resources. Um, I didn't mention this before, but you know we send out a newsletter every couple of weeks to the mentors with advice on things that you can send students based on trending topics that they're talking about in areas that they have struggles with. We also have a website with common referrals so the mentors can go on and find referrals to give to their mentees for different resources. So they're not expected to know all of this. They're just expected to know where to go to find the answers. Um, we also expect them to send us those insight flags. If there's something that's going on with a student that involves their health or their wellness, and that's of concern, um, to send us those flags and we will follow up with them. We will get them connected uh, with a wellness or health professional. Um, for our health professions ambassadors, we actually do a lot of actual specific training on how to coach students with the competitive stress of applying to health professions programs. Um, as you can imagine, they are extremely competitive programs and not everybody is always prepared in that moment in life. Not everybody's able to score what they need in order to be competitive. And so our students are doing a lot of work discussing parallel plans and finding options of good ways to keep focused on the productive outcomes. Um, there's a lot of stress associated with the questions of, am I good enough? Why can't I get in? And are we do a lot of training with our health profession students to help them frame questions, help students see the process. And again, to discuss those parallel plans, those identifying multiple options that can you can be pursuing both at the same time um, that are very related to the same types of goals that are leveraging those same skill sets to be able to make sure that students are pursuing the right fits for them. Uh, but again, knowing that the choice is the, is the, the, the student, it's not the peer's job, it's not the advisor's job to say, you're a good fit for this profession or you're not a good fit for this profession. But we need to empower them with, here's the resources, here's the information you need to make a decision, it's up to you. Yeah. Um, so it was really good to hear from both of you today um, to have this conversation. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Eva. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you. I want to thank Sarah, Tom, and Julie for joining us in this conversation again today. I, I, there were so many really great insights shared, and I really appreciated learning more about, you know, the breadth of work that is happening on your campuses. And I, I found all the logistics questions really helpful. I mean, it really provided really tangible examples of processes or considerations that someone can readily take and apply to their own mentoring and coaching programs at their colleges. So thank you all again for sharing your expertise. Um, to close out the video to our viewers, the practice guide on effective advising for post-secondary students can be accessed through the What Works Clearinghouse website. We will continue the conversation in the final video of the Practitioner's Perspectives video series, which will highlight recommendation four. That conversation will be moderated by expert panelist Brett, Brett McFarlane. If you have any uh, additional questions, feel free to connect with Sarah via email. Her email address is displayed on the slide. And thank you again to our panelists um, and to those of you who are viewing at home. We hope to see you in the final video. Thanks, everyone.